Another thing that really I thought was so interesting is, is the work that was done on research on couples and, mm-hmm. and the idea that, that you could actually be more genetically similar to your spouse than even a second cousin, for example. Yep. How in the world does that occur? It's interesting because, you know, uh, hundreds of years ago, we lived in small villages and most of us did marry somebody who is, if not literally our cousin, someone who could easily be traced um, mm. to to our same family tree. Okay. Um, today, certain societies like the United Arab Emirates or Pakistan has still have a high rate of first cousin marriage, you know, between two thirds and 70% of marriages are between first cousins. And um, that's a whole different topic that, of uh, where it creates um, genetic risk for recessive inherited diseases and so forth. But um, in, in the U- contemporary US, we think of ourselves as so far from that. You know, right. that, vi- right. that village clannish approach to reproduction, you know, you literally can swipe through an almost an infinite amount of potential um, mates uh, on these online apps today. But because ironically, because we have so much choice, we end up choosing people who are genetically more similar to us. So you, you mentioned um, overall that um, spouses, when you look across the entire genome, spouses are as genetically similar as second cousins. Um, and uh, when you get to specific polygenic indices, p- specific genetic signatures, um, the like uh, for for something for education, we're more like first cousins marrying mm. each other, and for height, we're more like half siblings because we're sorting so much on height and so much on education that we end up making ourselves much more genetically similar uh, on the on the genes that matter for those traits um, to our to our um, spouses than we would be to an to the, a random person in society, and that in turn has implications for how much inequality there's going to be the next uh, in height or in education or in, in any trait, um, the, the, the uh, next, you know, next generation. Um, so how close are we to uh, a dating app that's driven by uh, polygenetic uh, influences here? Yeah. Um, uh, we literally could be there tomorrow if the right, if uh, you know, okay. if the right, the, all the pieces are in place, um, which leads us to like a, another discussion about how um, how these polygenic indices are Absolutely. going to be used in, used in society, you know, once they break out of the lab, so to speak. Um, yeah, you know, one of one of the more fanciful uh, possible applications is. Um, well, notwithstanding that 23andMe just filed for bankruptcy, yes, but, yes. so let's say Ancestry.com, you know, you download your raw data, um, you upload it into an, this dating app that's kind of piggybacks on Tinder or Hinge or whatever the hot yep. one is now. Yep. Um, and uh, it calculates and displays your certified polygenic scores for a variety of traits, <laughs> along with your your photos and your description yep, of how you lo- yep. you love cats and dogs or whatever. <laughs> um, and people have that information in the dating. I, I, you know, maybe only nerds would go for that um, dating site, but I, I, I think that would be more than a novelty as this seeps into society. More, most people don't know about polygenic indices right now, but I think that's going to change in the next few years. If you think about how it may actually influence society, policy, other things, where does that take you in your thinking and the, and the upside or the downside of that? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of um, important policy questions that come out of this um, this new world, um, this sort of social genomics revolution, yep. I call it. Um, so just to take a few examples, um, we, we have to make certain decisions about insurance markets, about schools and so forth yes. and, yep. and, uh, and dating apps and, and, um, uh, you know, OVA and sperm donor banks. So for example, um, um, right now it is a hundred percent legal for a, um, fertility clinic to sample, um, embryo. Like if you ended up with a dozen viable embryos after doing, you know, uh, fertility cycles, um, uh, you, there are companies now that will um, extract DNA from each of those 12 embryos and calculate the polygenic scores of each embryo and then allow you to decide which one to implant based on that information, um, which baby to have. And um, there's a bunch of babies 
um, already born. Um, the first one was born in 2020 um, that have been, you know, polygenically optimized, so to speak. Is that what um, you call it? Polygenetically optimized? I mean, I, I'm just throwing that out there. I, it's yeah. not a term <laughs> I generally, you know, have had a lot of practice saying, but um, the, yeah, there's, so there, there are fertility clinics doing this now. We are the wild west when it comes to fertility medicine, like other countries. Um, I think France, for example, doesn't even let you choose the sex of your offspring, hmm. um, um, e even though it, that's root, pretty routine in the U.S. Yep, yep. Um, and so there's really no regulation. And that might be fine. We might want to let people to do what they want um, with with this new technology in the fertility clinic. And even though it's very um, eerily uh, echoing of, of the movie Gattaca in 1997, yes, yes, yes. Um, which literally is, yeah, this is literally Gattaca has arrived. 